Quickly though, before this episode starts, I've got a 10 second favor that I'd like to ask you. The majority of people watching this podcast haven't yet hit the follow button. I can't tell you how much it helps. The show gets bigger, which means we can increase our production and also allows us to bring in some of the best guests that you want to see while allowing us to continue to do the thing that we love. Thank you so much for your time. Erin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. It's uh, it's a nice little introduction we've had uh, through Mutual. So I always love those. I always love those. Yeah. That's where the most fun comes through. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Just awesome people doing awesome things. Exactly. That's the whole tagline of the <laughs> the podcast. So you've now, and that is, that is the end of the episode. Let's <laughs> <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> and we're done. And we're done. Well, I'd love to get started by um, asking what is an elevator pitch of who you are, what you do, and how you're contributing to the world? I love this. I It was really funny when you sent, you know, questions for me to ponder on before this. I saw that question. I was like, oh, God, this is my most dreaded question. However, <laughs> I then saw a piece of content of yours where you talked about the generalist. I'm like, okay. It's all right. I can relax. You'll understand. It's so hard for me to kind of go in and describe like who I am in an elevator pitch because I just want to do all the things. That's who I am. <laughs> I am someone who wants to do all the things. But if I did have to describe it, you know, for your viewers, hi, everyone. Lovely to meet you. Um, so I'm Erin, Erin May Henry on the internet. Basically, I'm a content creator, entrepreneur. My whole entire philosophy, everything that I'm trying to do, everything that I'm trying to do in the world, the change that I want to see is really twofold, but they kind of coincide together. I just want people to live an extraordinary life. Like I really, really want people to do extraordinary things, to live an extraordinary life. And the two pathways in which I do that is first of all, through helping them to build a business. I have my company, the Chillpreneur Company, which is ultimately We teach people how to build a business. We teach people how to build a brand, but do it in a way that is very counterculture, the anti-hustle. We believe that you don't have to dedicate, you know, all day, every day, grinding, hustling your life away to change people's lives or to do extraordinary work in the world. We believe that you can have an awesome life. You can travel, you can have hobbies, you can have great relationships and still do awesome work in the world, as well as my other mission that I'm on is to essentially teach people how to become the coolest person they know, specifically women. You know, I'm turning 34 next year and I... She's getting on. (laughs) Hey, she's getting young. (laughs) But, you know... No, I'm just kidding. I'm the same. (laughs) I I just, I want women, because I've worked with women, you know, for such a long time now. And the one thing that kept coming back was like, I'm too old. I can't, you know, people aren't going to take me seriously. And I just want people to know that no matter how old you are, no matter where you are in life, you can still do anything, whether that be a new hobby, a new relationship, a new country, a new business. Your age does not define who you are or how the world should be perceiving you. At any stage of life, you can do extraordinary things. So through the pathway of personal development and through the pathway of business, I just want people to live an extraordinary life, really. I love that. I love that. So would you say you live an extraordinary life? I do. I do. I definitely, definitely do. I mean, my story is kind of, you know, lots of different loops and twists and turns, but I had um, something happened to me a few years ago, nothing major, but that was really where a lot of this passion and purpose was birthed out of because I would say that even though I was, you know, my had my YouTube channel, I had my business and I was really satisfied with a lot of the work that I was doing, there was still that just soul part of my experience that wasn't quite there. Um, and so I had gone... I mean, long story short, I was in a long-term relationship. I was engaged. We had the house. We had all the kind of like society stuff, you know what I mean? The shoulds, the things you should do. And when I was 30, after the lockdowns and after all of that, I just turned around and the extraordinary wasn't quite there. You know, I lived a great life. I was doing awesome work through my business, but it was just missing that extraordinary piece. I realized that a big part of that was that I wasn't happy in the relationship that I was in. It wasn't really suited to who I was or the goals that I had in my life. And I just wanted to explore connecting with that inner child part of me more, you know, just doing 
more things that were outside of the status quo, outside of like society's norms. So I did end up leaving that relationship and basically went on like a hobby, change my life kind of rampage. I learned how to ride a motorbike. I started doing martial arts, try to learn to DJ. I know you DJ. <laughs> Still not very good, but I try. Skateboarding, went traveling, all the things like just I wanted to allow myself, regardless of my age, regardless of anything, to just explore anything that felt exciting to me, explore anything mm. that felt expressive to me. I just mm. think so many people think that when they become an adult, specifically as women, that if we're a businesswoman, we have to be serious, we have to be professional, we have to be, you know, the boss for people to take us seriously or we have to be motherly. And there's just so many labels that we put on ourselves and expectations that draw us away from our interests, our passions, mm. the things that really would create an extraordinary life. You don't have to have millions of dollars to explore the things that are essentially going to light you up. So I just decided to go on that journey and now that's what I want to inspire other people to do as well. What did you take from the uh, skills development? What was the most profound skills that you developed or the thing that you explored? Talking about, you know, you speak about like the the health, wealth um, and like the soul part of this journey, the wisdom part of this journey. I think the biggest thing, and this is why I really resonated with one of your videos that I took away, is not actually that any particular skill taught me anything, but rather you don't have to have skill to learn. And what I mean Mm. by that is you can learn so much from being bad at things. You can Mm. learn so much from just having fun with things. I think Mm. so much of why I didn't explore these hobbies or passions or interests in the first place was because I thought if it's not going to become a vocation or if it's not good, if I'm not going to be good at it, then kind of like why bother? Whereas there are certain things like martial arts, Muay Thai, I've definitely progressed in a more professional manner, um, like joined a fight team and stuff, whereas like skateboarding and DJing, just the fun of doing things just because you want to is as powerful as being good at something. And I think mm. so many people hold themselves back from trying new things, exploring new things because they think, what's the point? What's the point if I'm not good enough? What's the point if I you know, don't progress in this? But sometimes just doing something for the fun of it is actually where you learn the most. Yeah, definitely. The um, uh, I'm similar to you. I'll just try a bunch of things. Yeah. <clears throat> My current obsession is chess. <laughs> and, um, did you watch The Queen's Gambit? <laughs> I did ages ago, but I just, it just, it's a new thing that's picked up. And yeah. um, I played it for years, but yeah. I've never played it properly. And then I went to I was in New York for six months this year and I began to go to this cool chess club. It was at a bar, like really nice candle lit, kind of like young crew. It was really, really fresh. And um, I started playing again and I I just, something clicked. And ever since I've just been playing nonstop and I'm noticing that the, um, my focus is improving. Yeah. It's as though I've begun to work on a muscle that I haven't worked on in a while. Um, And I'm noticing it's, I'm beginning to view the world in a bit of like a different way Mm -hmm. because of this game that I'm playing. Yeah. So, and it's affecting other parts of my life in the positive. So, you know, I'm not planning on becoming a chess grandmaster anytime soon. It'd be nice, but not planning on it. But I think to your point, um, these develop, the development of these random non, you know, associated skills yeah. have vocational skills natural yeah have natural um progressions into other parts of your life yeah. they all kind of it's like a web that begins to start fitting into one another and yeah. you end up just taking pieces from over here and putting it over here and you go oh that could use that down here <laughs> and next I will thing you say, know you're a well-rounded person a funny story it's not really a funny story but like An interesting story that paints that point perfectly is when I started doing motocross. So that's something I've wanted to do for a long time. My brother and my dad both ride. And I started doing motocross and I was terrible when I first started. But doing motocross was actually one of the things that taught me not to compare myself to other people. Because I, as I said, I started learning this when I was 30 years old and I'm not even joking. I was riding alongside like four-year-old kids Mm. that were doing much better than me on the jumps, that were faster than me. Like I'm on this track being 
fully just little taken over. Little, <laughs> little, little kids. And I'm like on like a one, two, five Yamaha. And I'm like, ah, so scared. But, you know, I just had so much fun. Again, because mm. there was no pressure to perform. It wasn't something that I was doing for work or to, like I was literally just there for myself. And in that moment, I realized okay, I could sit here and be like, I suck. There's all these like literally little kids better than me at this, but that's going to rob me of the experience of having Mm -hmm. fun. Who cares if I'm slow? Like nobody's going home. Now these four-year-old kids aren't going home and be like, did you see that lady? She sucked. Nobody's thinking about me. They're just concentrating on, well, first of all, not falling off and, (laughs) you know, getting injured. But you really can rob yourself of having such an incredible experience when you compare yourself. And I think that's a part of why being bad at something that doesn't have high stakes is a really good opportunity to challenge that comparison. Mm. Well, just remember as well, um, you could probably beat the four-year-olds in a fight. If you to. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't try, but knowing that You've I could. That in, is- your back- <laughs> in your back pocket. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they might be able to beat you on the track, but you can always kick them over. <laughs> well, that's such a big part of this whole, like, becoming the coolest person. You know, it's funny you say that because... Kicking over children. No! <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> not that exactly, but, you know, I think when you, exactly like you said, you become like a well-rounded person. When you have things, hobbies, skills, interests, passions that are, like, just for you, it can help you to go into new environments with that just extra edge of confidence. Like, for mm. example, I, again, I've been doing Muay Thai for, for quite a long time and, like, I consider myself to be quite skilled in that area. When I go to the gym, like weightlifting, I I suck. Like, I really do. Uh, for and now. For now. It's not something I'm even trying to progress into, but, like, it's just not, I, like, I'm looking at everyone and I'm, like, with the five kilo weights just doing, like, the old grandma lifts. But. It's just in the back of your mind, it's like, but I do Muay Thai. You know what I mean? Like I have this thing that's my thing and whilst all these other people might be like ahead of me or better than me or however you want to perceive it, when you have those things that are just for you, when you are that well-rounded human being, when you have those accomplishments that you can put onto your own little mental mental piece, that's when you can put yourself in new situations where you do like you're not as good at something or it's, it's a new environment that you want to explore. But just knowing that you have these things that, are already yours, if that makes sense. Mm, definitely, definitely. You you mentioned the inner child piece as well. Mm. It, I come across this quite a lot. Yeah. I think uh, we're all a bit too serious these days <laughs> mm. and I'm not <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, no, I am when I need to be. But life is great when you just kind of, don't take it as seriously as a lot of people do. Yeah. And I think that taking it seriously is more of an insecurity thing. Yeah. But it's a conditioning thing as well because I'm very much the same in that, you know, there's always that part of you that makes consideration to age and not to keep bringing the conversation back to that, but like, you know, at a certain age you should have a certain level of achievement. You should have ticked these certain boxes. You should dress in a certain way, act in a certain way. I really do agree with you when it comes to the inner child stuff. I feel like we all would be so much happier if we just allowed ourselves to connect to that inner child more often. And when I say inner child, like I know there's the more therapeutic healing part of inner child work where you go back and you actually heal trauma. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. When I talk about inner child, I'm more talking about desire because a lot of the stuff playing, a lot of the stuff that has brought me the most joy, the most confidence, the most lessons, the most, the best identity, like I see myself as like quite a unique person now, which brings this whole other level of self-love and self-confidence. And so much of that is being, allowing myself to explore the more childlike parts of my desire. The martial arts came from, I was obsessed with the movie Milan when I was a kid, like Mm -hmm. obsessed, like watch it weekly. That's why I started martial arts. Um, And even with like style and fashion, I'm also obsessed with claw machines, like just allowing myself to go, you know, the the core, the core plushing machines, just those little things. I just don't think we allow ourselves to do these things that we consider or categorize to be childlike. And yet these 
expressive parts of ourselves can massively impact all of the other areas of our life, our happiness, our relationships, our creativity, our financial well-being. You know, we just exactly if we just didn't take things so seriously all the time, we can open ourselves up to like a whole new world. Mm. And how do you go about tapping into that child if you were to make it very clear and easy for somebody to try? Play. Absolutely play because for every How does single, that look? yeah, for, I think it's going to look different for every single person. So for someone to just think back to the times where they would have the most fun, the most play when they were a child, for some people that's sport, you know, for some people doing sport, a sport, skateboarding, rollerblading, playing footy, like whatever, whatever you consider to be fun, um, video games. I love me some Mario Kart, Mario Party, (laughs) those kinds of things. Fashion is a really good way to express yourself, to connect with that, to be playful in your style expression. But just the word that will always come to mind to connect to the inner child for me, the pathway, the gateway, if you will, is play, allowing yourself to play and that you don't have to be so serious to be taken serious. Mm, yeah, actually, that's a very, very good point. Um, I wrote a little note here. You can also have fun and be effective at the same time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like you when don't. did we when did we learn that having fun, being childlike, playing can't go hand in hand with massive getting impact, shit yeah. getting shit done, productivity, being taken seriously in the business world. You know, why should the way that someone spends their free time or what brings them joy affect their ability to like, crush it in the online space or in the entrepreneurial world the two if anything go more hand in hand in that just like we said you'll learn obscure lessons through play that you won't learn otherwise and you got to be willing to fail yeah and look like an idiot i think that's the big key there being okay with looking silly yeah yeah because in the space of looking silly you begin to look less silly mm-hmm. so I mean, I've, I've recently had a, um, I realized this a little while ago um, and it re, it kind of, the point got driven home <clears throat> recently because I went from not being able to run at all and then ended up doing a marathon. Oh, congrats. And um, it was a lot and it, I, I, I couldn't, I wasn't a runner ever, yeah. like at all. And the process of just starting off small, putting in effort, and letting it build over time can be applied to everything mm-hmm. with a goal in mind. And then I moved, when I, when I did that, I moved on to, all right, what's next? And I started doing calisthenics and then now I can do muscle ups and handstands. That's so cool. Next thing. It's like, what next? Yeah. I mean, but, but the amount of times I'm at the gym and I'm jumping around like an idiot and I'm falling on my head and I'm just like doing stupid shit. People are laughing at me, but they're not really laughing at me. They're just like laughing at the situation. No one actually cares about what you're doing or care about you because yeah. they're so caught up in their own shit. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, and if they do care about you, they look at you, they make a comment and then they move on with their day because they've got a million other comments that they're making about all these other people. Yeah. And 90% of the time you don't know anyway. So who cares? You know, if someone had made a comment about yeah. you, let's say to their friends, like that's up to your own perspective to lean into that like you can make up a story that someone has said something about you well they haven't either way you don't really know so if you're just focused on you and having fun and playing yeah i mean people have a lot of opinions but most you know what's that saying opinions are like assholes everyone has one (laughs) (laughs) that's a good one (laughs) but you don't also have to look at it if you don't want to (laughs) no and sometimes they're shitty as well (laughs) Damn, this can get deep. <laughs> oh, yeah. Deep and graphic. Oh, yeah, that's what we do. That's what we do. <laughs> um, how you've spoken about confidence briefly in that. I think that's a big part of this. Um, how do you go about developing confidence? Because you're in a you're in the space of, you know, in the content space. That's a very forward facing industry to be in. It's very challenging and there's a lot of insecurity. There's a lot of feedback that a lot of the times is negative because people are gnarly. <laughs> when you put them in front of a keyboard, they're fucking wild. Um, yeah, how, how have you gone about developing an internal sense of confidence, maintaining that confidence even in the face of like yeah. you know, hate? It's so funny that you say that because I have a video that's going 
relatively viral right now, which is really a lot on the topics that we're speaking about. You know, it's kind of me telling my story and ex- just talking about how I like left a relationship and tried to learn skateboarding and all this stuff and it's gone viral and the comments are brutal. Let's just say, to say the least, <laughs> the comments are absolutely brutal. Um, for that specifically, when it comes to content creation and handling like the brutality of other people's opinions and other people's projections online, you have to have a solid sense of self. I know that's almost so elementary to say, but your relationship to self, your self perspective, if that isn't rock solid, every single time something does happen, you'll just be swayed in so many different directions. And it can really cause like this internal chaos, like the nervous system will start to freak out. You start to believe what other people are saying. You know, you start to identify with what other people are saying. The less you know yourself, the more that you become how other people perceive you. And so with the whole becoming the coolest person, you know, which is like, again, my life philosophy, the way that I visualize it to make it really graphic for everyone is almost like a Venn diagram with three circles you know you being the coolest person you know you're having a good self-concept a great identity sitting at the center of self-efficacy so self-efficacy is you doing things and proving to yourself that you can do them Mm -hmm. so I say I'm going to I don't know go learn a certain skill and then I follow through with that, right? So I basically know within myself that I I can do the things that I say I can do. Mm. With that is self-worth. That's the second circle. Self-worth is you truly reprogramming if you need to through hypnosis, through meditation, whatever. This is the more soul aspect of it to fully understand that your worth as a human being is not contingent on anything. Definitely not on other people's opinions, not on other people's perspectives, but it's also not continuing on the things that you achieve, even though it sounds kind of productive to what we just spoke about. This is why it all works together. But you are just worthy regardless. And when you can fully, fully believe that you're worthy of success, love, money, whatever you want. That's how do you, if you don't believe that though, how do you begin to believe that? I really like reprogramming work because whether it be through, you know, whatever modality, there's a billion different ways that you can go about this, but you're, you didn't come into this world, into this planet feeling unworthy. You know I mean? They always talk about like children, they'll like scream and cry to get what they want because they just believe that they deserve it in that moment. It's primal at that stage. But through our environmental conditioning, whether it be school, friends, a lot of the time parents, somewhere along the line, we learned that we were unworthy. You know, we learned that you can't have this. You're not smart enough. You're not this, that, and the other. You know, you don't deserve that or you have to do this in order to get that. So we learned it. And so that's a neurological pathway within our brain. That's however you want to picture it. I mean, a lot of people would describe it as like stored trauma in the body. Some people would say it's a neurological thing, whatever. Either way, it needs to be released or reprogrammed. And so Mm. whether you do therapy, talk therapy, you know, somatic therapy, hypnosis, plant medicine, I mean, meditation, anything, anything to kind of remove that story lodged somewhere within your body that you are unworthy. And then the third circle is self-love. But also a lot of people talk about self-love and I think self-love is very inherent anyway. I think that a lot of the time we would protect ourselves if necessary. Something that I think we can work on as a part of self-love or as a subcategory of self-love is not just loving ourselves but liking ourselves. And this is where like the loving yourself is more of a respect thing. You know what I mean? Like when you love yourself, I'm going to feed myself, I'm going to take care of myself. Like I I inherently love myself. That sits under the category of that worth piece as well. A lot of people like will love themselves but still not think highly of themselves, you know, still not think that they are the coolest person that they know, that they are worth being a leader, that they are a vibe, however you want to describe, you know, we describe this person's a vibe, that person's cool, this situation, that music, that song. They don't like, you know, when you like something, you talk about it, you recommend it, you know, you tell everyone about it, that like promotional piece of things that we idolize. Having that kind of same relationship with ourselves is almost like the step next to self-love, you know what I mean? It's not just about taking care of yourself. It's about, and a lot of people hate when I say this, but idolizing yourself in a sense, not in an egotistical way. It's not 
comparing yourself to other people and saying I'm better than. It's just saying like, I'm a vibe. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cool dude. I'm a cool gal, whatever. <laughs> Having that relationship with yourself. And so when you put all those th- three things together, the worth, the respect, the efficacy, and the relationship, that's where I think true confidence is built from. Mm. Okay. The, um, you mentioned off air, <laughs> uh, following on this thread of, of challenging situations and maintaining confidence and stuff, you mentioned off air that there's a Reddit thread about you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's talk about that for a second and then let's also talk about what's going on, what was said, how you felt about it and what you now do to maintain that confidence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Reddit thread was, so I can't even remember exactly what people were saying, but basically just saying that I am a scam artist, which is the label that anyone will slap on anybody who talks about business you know what I mean everything Mm, that is mm. in the business category also somehow is an MLM of sorts so a lot of that kind of language (laughs) thrown around um but saying and it's really interesting actually because the reason why I remember reading this thread is because it was a couple of days after I posted about being inconsistent I sometimes do struggle and this is a part of my journey with I'm interested in so many things. As you can probably tell by this conversation, you know, you asked what's the elevator pitch. I'm like, everything, all at once. Everything. (laughs) That's my elevator pitch. And, you know, sometimes you have that internal like, oh, life would be so much easier if I could just be an expert at one thing and try one thing. I don't know it would be as interesting, but, you know, what comes with being multi-passionate, multifaceted, I also have ADHD, so and I was about to say, I just, I just made a note saying ADHD question yeah. mark. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so you see all those memes of people being like, I've got all of these hobbies and interests and haven't finished any of them. Very much yeah, yeah. a part of my experience. But regardless of that, you know, I made this kind of like post where I was like, one of my insecurities is actually my greatest power. Like I really enjoy, I, I like having ADHD. I like uh, being interested in a whole lot of things. I think it keeps life spicy, you know, get to experience a whole lot of different stuff. But it also can be an insecurity because just like, you know, you mentioned in your video, like you never really get to that top percentile. You don't have the time, the mental capacity, the space to like master something. And there's just a small light inside of me that maybe craves that. Anyway, I found this Reddit thread. I got something for you. Yeah. (laughs) On that note. So we'll come back to it. Finish what you're saying. We'll come back to it. But of course, as the universe will have it, when you find, you know, a Reddit thread about you, it will be about like the one thing that you're really insecure about. Uh, But basically this Reddit thread was like, yeah, she was like, oh, she's always changing her brand. She's always changing her mind. She's such a scam artist. Like, you know, she's so inconsistent. It's like one day she's a manifestation coach, which by the way, I never coach on manifestation, but you know, she's like a manifestation coach and then she's a fitness coach and then she's a thing. But anyway, like I... That as well as like kind of, again, what's going on at the moment. Like I said, I have a, a reel going relatively well and there's a lot of kind of like really vile stuff on there, to be honest. Um, but it's no different to what I said before, like maintaining confidence, maintaining integrity to self is can only be done because I so deeply know who I am. You know mm. what I mean? I'm not sitting here allowing this to shake up my nervous system because I'm worried that people will think that, oh, maybe I am changing my mind too much or maybe, you know, all of these comments on this reel is true. Like I can read them in such a neutral state because it's not actually me. Like it's it, it's mm. my content, it's my platforms, it's my brand, it's all these things that they're talking about, but what they're saying is not me. And what I mean by that, it's not the me that I know. And at the end mm. of the day, like I feel that's why building that relationship to self is so important because if you're going to create content, if you're going to be online, if you want to build a big audience, if you want to become influential in any sorts, like there's going to come a point where you've reached sort of max capacity of let's call it safety. You know what I mean? Like safety content. Yeah. The safety capacity where you're probably not going to get that much feedback, but you could be talking about puppies. I mean, I love dog content. I'm obsessed with dog content. Uh, Some of the comments on this dog content are like savagery. Like people are (laughs) horrible. It's like a picture, a puppy getting a pamper and the, like the comments are like animal abuse. This person is, this person needs to jump (laughs) over. Like honestly, no, no content is safe at a certain level of visibility. 
And so, <laughs> so you have to get to the point where it's like, if you're going to go down that path, you know, it's not for everyone, but if you are going to go down that path where you're exposing yourself to the potential of a lot of people's opinions, if you're going to be swayed by those opinions, that's where you should be doing the work first. Don't they, I, I read somewhere and I don't know the exact number, but it said something along the lines of like two or 3% of the world are actually psychopaths. Like, <laughs> I've never heard that. Oh, but. Like there's, a, there's a genuine percentage of the world yeah. that is an actual psych, like clinical psychopath. Now, if you think about it, if you've got a million, if you've got a million views on, a, on something yeah. and you get a thousand comments, yeah. you're going to have 30 comments from actual psychopaths. <laughs> I mean, and some of them, I wouldn't put it past them. Not making a you clinical know, if- assumption of anyone, but you read some of these comments there. Yeah, they're, they're interesting. Um, This is going to be like the corny thing that I do want to say just as a small injection here, but I do try to a lot of the time as well, like when I am having these experiences, try to show up with empathy too, because, you know, you do read these comments. A lot of them are just vile and gross and like, whatever, you're just looking for attention, which also I feel bad for you as well, but, you know, a lot of the times when I'm reading these comments, because a lot of them are about like, you know, women's biological clocks and like relationships and all of these kind of stuff you read these comments and like whilst they are mean while they're nasty while they can be kind of chaotic in a sense a lot of the time it does show like a lack of education it shows a lack of understanding lack of experience like this person is getting their information from like you know tlc or something like that like reality tv and the news and all of this kind of stuff so a lot of the times ejecting yourself from the situation altogether is really helpful and just sending Mm kind of love to this this person sometimes you just starve starve them of oxygen yeah and then they go away yeah yeah absolutely but the most important thing is that it doesn't knock you off course you know what i mean Mm. like you're creating content whether it's controversial content or not whether it's stuff that people will massively agree with or not either way like the reason why you're creating content in the first place is to make a difference in people's lives and if you do run into you know a lot of opposition don't let that make you lose sight of the fact that you know because with all of these like you know hundreds of comments that are pretty vile on this post like there's triple quadruple even 10x the amount of comments people being like this was so helpful this is so powerful this changed my life and I think I've got a lot of content creator friends and where they do get into those dark places is when they focus so much on the negative side of things and let it draw Mm. them away from the people that they're actually helping Mm. Then it becomes well, that's worth just human it. nature. Yeah, that's that just human nature bias. to focus on the negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, I guess, we need to recognize it and then work three times as hard against it because it's the pull is so much stronger. Yeah. There were two things I wanted to flag with you on this topic uh, of not being in the top one percent was the first one. I, I read this thing that basically said, you know, if you are in the top 20% of three different categories, you're basically in the top 1% of those three categories combined. So if you- I like that. So if you um, if you say take top 20% in sales, top 20% in content, top 20% in, I don't know, psychology, bring them all together, you are in your niche in the top 1%. And the way that the internet has given access to so many- so much more of an audience being in that top 1% of, you know, those multiple niches combined allows you to reach an audience that is more than enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily the end of the world to be in the top 1% of one Lots skill. Of Do you know, it's so funny you say that because I teach a similar thing in one of my programs. It's called Influential AF Academy, which is based on this premise that if you're building an audience, if you're trying to become a leader in your space, there's no one perfect pathway. You know, so many people teach social media in such like a copy and paste kind of way, whereas we have developed this system called the creator archetype system where we give different social media strategies based on the type of creator you are. You know, we have educators, relationship-based creators, lifestyle creators, entertainers, and there are different strategies, different platforms, content formats, um, and even engagement strategies that will work better for a different type of creator. Like I would make the guess that you're a conversationalist just from. I don't know. One, <laughs> we have a quiz. So you Maybe can take it. Some, <laughs> I'll send I'll you the quiz. Yeah, please. I'd be um, curious. 
I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. (laughs) It's really, really based on like natural skills, personality sets, like there'll be a certain content pathway that's going to be best suited towards you. Within that, we take it one step further where we take your niche or like the topic that you're mostly speaking about, your creator archetype. I love a Venn diagram, by the way. So this is also another Venn diagram. Your niche, your creator archetype, and then your personal points of difference. You know, these are your values, your opinions, your interests, your quirks, you know, someone who has ADHD, like your, your the way your brain works, all these little things that make you you. And at the center of that, we call it an industry of one. So when, Sounds you, similar, yeah. when you lean into it, you know, you might have the way that you create, what you talk about and who you are. If you fully embody all of those things, like I know that there are no other like business coaches, mentors, teachers, whatever I call myself, it changes day to day. Um, but who are also, you know, motorbike riding, martial arts, learning to DJ, doing all of these things, who also has ADHD, who also lives in Australia, who, you know, all these Mm. different things that make us, us, we massively, there are 50 million people creating content actively at this point, but we can Mm. massively reduce that competition, even within our niche, fully embodying all of these parts of ourselves exactly like you said whether or not we're like the best at it but if we're just us at it Mm. we become the only one Mm. and there's another thing called the thousand true fans have you heard of that yeah 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 very much create a lot around that the kevin kelly was the guy's name i I think yeah but that dedicated community i love it um hold on community was something i want to talk about so let's come back to that but uh, there's one other thing I want to say on this topic before we move on. Uh, actually, two things. There's a book. Have you heard of the book Range by David Epstein? No. So it's basically a book about generalists. So basically it's called Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. I need to read. Maybe. That sounds like my Maybe book. <laughs> Maybe you can have a look. I'll uh, send Definitely. it to you. Yeah, yeah, have a look for sure. Um, and then I'll send it over. And then um, – the other thing was, have you heard of uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Man in the Arena speech? No. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read it out because I <laughs> love this. I read love it, read this. it. I'm excited. Um, okay. Now, you can swap out man or woman. In, in this one, it says man. Um, but it says, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, who faces, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error or shortcoming. But who does actually strive to? Do, but who does actually strive to do the deeds? Know who great enthusiasm, the great devotion, who spends himself a worthy cause, who at the best knows the end, knows in the end the triumph of triumph of high achievement. And who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Yeah, I love that. Just get in there and do the thing. So, yeah, yeah. I so he, I, I think he, um, he, that was early 1900s. So he did a speech in Paris of 1910 and that was in the speech. I love that. I love that. And it is, it's, you know, the, I think it's called the top 10 regrets of the dying or something like that. There's another book. Yeah. Top five regrets of the dying. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like one of the biggest, or that's the one that like, I haven't read the book, but you know, you see the, you know, clippings all over. Yeah. (laughs) The summaries everywhere. And I think that's one of them, you know, that I didn't just like try, like I didn't go for more things that I didn't um, just give things that I was interested in a go. And I think that's something that so many people do regret and coming back to the whole thing around like age and it's never too late. I think the further along people get on their journey, the less they think they can. And that's a big part of what I want to, with my personal brand, with my business is just show people like, I know I'm not the oldest person in the world, by the way, but I just want to show people that second like- Second oldest. I'm the second oldest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right behind you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spiritually, but no, but- I just want to show people like no matter what it is exactly like that speech says it's so much better to be in there victorious or failing than to not be in there at At least you're in it. You're going to learn. You're going to grow. You're going to have fun. You're going to get dirty. You're going to meet people like whatever it is that comes Mm. of it. 
you know, mm. you never know. And this like linking it in with business and entrepreneurship and content creation, you never know when your next million dollar, million follower idea is going to come from, you know, mm. you, the, the idea, the piece of content, the business, the product, the service that just is your thing, you know, it becomes your purpose, becomes the work that turns everything around for you. We talked just before recording about that exponential growth, you know, often something mm. happens, whether it's a collaboration, whether it's an idea or it's an interview or whatever, where it just starts to cascade things in an upward direction. And mm. I feel from working with thousands of people at this stage that so many times when I've seen this pivot in someone's life, it's when they've exposed themselves to a unique, like a unique environment or a new unique situation, mm. trying a new hobby, going to a new country, meeting a new person, you know, this way mentorship and masterminds and all of that kind of stuff is so powerful because it's sometimes just that one conversation, but you have to be willing to expose yourself, be vulnerable, try new things, put yourselves in those environments, even though it's scary. Look silly. And look silly, and you never know when that, oh, my God, this is the thing moment's going to come. You've inspired me. This <laughs> this podcast has been a tough – it's hard. this podcast is very hard work. Like sure. we're doing a weekly episodes and my sole goal, initial goal, was to get to above 20 episodes because I read somewhere that you're in the top 1% of podcasts if you get above 20 episodes. That's cool. I didn't so know So we got there. Ah, we got there. Not many listeners to begin with, but now – it's slowly starting to yeah. pick up. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I was doing the first 20 episodes to an echo chamber of me. <laughs> Can I ask then, you a question? Go on. What's it for? Me. What's the podcast for? So I, throughout my whole life, I'm a very curious person. Yeah. I'm very curious about the world since day one. I've had a very wide variety of life experiences. And from a very early age, I was very interested in like personal development health, um, uh, mindset and all, and, you know, business and all these very wide topics. Now from about 18, I began to dig into it. I began to read all the books. I began to do all that sort of stuff, you know, and then from 23, I'm like running a business and then I've gotten into more spirituality and, you know, I've done a Vipassana and I do a lot of yoga and I've just basically traveled a lot. I've basically experienced a lot of random shit in my time. And also through this journey, there has been, you know, different girlfriends or, you know, a new housemate or um, for whatever time period in my life, I've spent an extended amount of time with, you know, different people. And majority of the time, the people that I spend my life with for a longer period of time they change around me. So they change into better versions of themselves after spending time with me to this point where I'm like, I I swear to God, I'm like, good luck, Chuck. When it comes to really, (laughs) like I meet these women, we date, they move on, (laughs) they grow, they move on, they get married. (laughs) I'm like, happy to help. (laughs) I love that though. I mean, not the whole good luck chuckle. No, it's fine. I'm happy. I've accepted my role. I've accepted my role in the world. I don't mind. I'm, I'm chilling. But the point I make is that at some point I realized that I actually am quite impactful Mm. and I know a lot about a lot and I'm able to connect with people and I feel like it's become a bit of my duty to be able to create content to hopefully share this knowledge to as many people as I can. And have that and impact as well. Like, and Hopefully. On a scale. So scale the impact. That's yeah. pretty much the goal. Scale the impact that I've had on, on people on a one-on-one basis more. But I'm a little bit lazy and I'm not going to – I'm not – I haven't been good at doing the like – YouTube videos or reels. So I figured the podcast allows me to just talk to people and then the little bits of magic will pop out Yeah, when they pop out yeah. and then that can become the content. So that's pretty much the whole reason why I'm here. I love it. And isn't that such a beautiful depiction of what we just spoke about as well? You mentioned that you've had all of these different life experiences, you know, different travel experience, relationship experience, tried different hobbies, you said, running and yoga and all of these different things. And that now has- Also have ADHD. (laughs) (laughs) We're not superhumans. It's fine. (laughs) But but then taking 
those experiences and using that as the basis of essentially your life's work, you know, your mission, you're being able to fulfill, to pay it forward. That wouldn't have happened just to further paint that point of the speech that you just read. That wouldn't have happened if you hadn't put yourself in the game, in the arena, as he said, Mm. in all Mm. of those experiences of life, you know? And so I'm sure some of them were positive. Some of them were negative. Some were win triumphs or whatever he said. And they're all positives or lessons, right? Exactly. And then being able to, use that as content, as inspiration, as conversation. And that might be the thing that somebody turns around and says, oh, my God, like that just sparked an idea in me. And they talk about it on their Instagram stories and then 500 people share, you know what I mean? Like it's just the the endless possibilities come out of the experiences that we create for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, The ADHD thing is really interesting because I've – been very similar to you with trying a lot of things, just never quite locking into anything. And when I, do you know what a Vipassana is? No. It's uh, the 10 day, it's like a 10 day silent meditation uh, course. Yeah. Yeah. So right. I did one of those last year and that was the moment where I realized that I actually probably do have ADHD because it's probably the first time in my life where I don't have a phone. I don't have like a TV. I'm not talking to anyone. I'm not doing anything but sitting and walking around and eating. That's it. Now I'm like eight days into this thing and I've got my to-do list here. I've got this song playing on loop. I've got like a version of me watching the whole thing. I've got like someone thinking, oh, there's all at the same time. There's probably five or six, six things going on in my head. And I'm thinking to myself, this can't be normal. Normal. <laughs> typical. <laughs> <laughs> this can't be typical. Yeah. So after that, I then went to my therapist and I said, hey, look, I think there's something here. Do you want to look into it? And then we did some tests and she said, yeah, it's probably relevant. Let's go. I'd get you to a psychiatrist to kind of follow it further. I haven't got to the psychiatrist yet because they're booked out because everyone apparently has ADHD now. Yeah. But – What I've noticed in the process of realizing that maybe this is a thing, it's begun to give me a bit of a framework that is now allowing me to harness that energy. Yeah. And and I'm beginning to see ways of channeling it. So I think there is a way to be, to have ADHD and to be all over the place on your interest, but also be able to harness it, channel it into certain things. And I think once you can figure out how to have ADHD and channel that energy, you can become unstoppable. I love this. Like I'm obsessed with this conversation for so many reasons. Like ADHD or not, you know, I'm so glad that there's like so much awareness coming to this particular conversation. But what I think it does is it paints a bigger picture of something that we've been missing for all of us for such a long time, whether it be in entrepreneurship, whether it be in content creation, whether it be in health and fitness diet, is that we are all so different. And that Mm. quote, know thyself, might be the most basic yet powerful quote that we've been overlooking. The more that you know yourself, understand yourself, whether it's the way that your brain works, whether it's the way that your biology works, whether it's the way that your, you know, your love language, your creative style, your money, money, like the more that you can discover yourself, that should be the the dedicated journey that you go on in this lifetime to discover everything you can do about yourself. Like for ADHD, I had a biomarkers test. So you do like a neurotrans, you pee in a cup essentially and it like test all your neurotransmitters but like that information to me was so powerful because it's like the supplementation the I also had a hormones one at the same time you know I can go on the internet and be like I'm tired I get bad PMS or something like this and then someone's going to deliver me some kind of like pseudoscientific um, solution to my problem based on you know a few possible uh, pathways But going and getting these like very, very specific biomarker and hormonal tests to fully Where did you do that out of curiosity? You took it to it. I'll send you the detail to the company. Um, 
I can't remember what they're called, but you can, so you generally go to like, yeah. So if you wanted the neurotransmitter, you can go to psychologist, sorry, a psychiatrist, or you can get it from your naturopath. Um, I don't know if you can get the neurotransmitter one through your naturopath, but definitely the hormonal ones It's called the Dutch test, but generally some kind of like doctor and then they'll just send you the kit and then you do it at home, send it off. And then they send the results back. Um, but they're just, they're just, the point I was trying to make is like, there's such powerful information out there that we can learn about ourselves going. Yeah. Like seeing a psychologist, understanding your brain, understanding how your brain works. Even like I said, as a content creator, the reason why we put so much effort into developing these creator archetypes is because so much of social media is like, The way to blow up on Instagram is to take an eight second clip of any type of video and have a trending sound and put these hashtags and it's got to have this thing on it. It's like, sure, that stuff's going to work to a certain degree, but for every, you know, 100,000 people that try that strategy, you know, there's like 10 that work that tell you about it and then the rest, it it just does Survivorship bias. Yeah. And so when you fully understand yourself in any arena of life, it's going to give you the most potent strategy to getting the best results. You know, the Mm. type of diet that works for one person isn't going to work for the next person. The type Mm. of meditation that works for one person is not going to work for the next person. Our greatest discovery that will lead to the greatest success is ourselves. Mm. Mm. Well, that's uh, where doing the meditation course, for example, um, one of the core things in that was that the goal is to get as close to reality as possible. And the only thing that we know is reality. Well, this is what they said anyway. This is the idea. And the only thing that we know is as close to reality as possible is our internal Mm -hmm. sensations. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing for 10 days is you're just looking at what sensations are you feeling? What emotions are you feeling? How do those emotions feel as physical sensations? And that's it because it's all we really know. The rest is just projections of what we think Mm-hmm. other people are saying yeah, or doing or feeling, but we don't actually know. All we know is, you know, this feeling, the oh, feeling yeah. in your leg or the feeling in your back or the feeling in your stomach or, you know, so. That's powerful. Yeah. I reckon that could be super powerful, but I'm also terrified. I had a friend who did it as well and it. I was like, it seems like the type of thing that I think would be really powerful to, yeah, train focus and, pull myself away from that distraction because I, I do like time alone but I'm very I'm a very fidgety kind of person so putting myself in that environment might be a good challenge for the new year mm. well I'm the same I, I'm always moving I'm always fidgeting I'm full of energy and um, in the in the Vipassana there was a basically from day three onwards there were three one-hour sittings where you were to sit and not move. Find your position, sit and not move. And I've never done that before. And I am probably on the far end of the spectrum of people who could do that comfortably. And eventually I did it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, Proving to yourself. That self-efficacy. Yeah. You can do another thing. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. The uh, quick note on the, the top five regrets of the dying book. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to the next thing, I've got them here Yeah. for anyone that is interested. So number one was, I wish I'd had the courage. Actually, let's start this again. So the book is for anyone listening, right? And you'd know the book is this lady who works as a palliative care nurse, I think, and has dealt with lots of different people who would passed or were passing away. And she began to begin, she began to get a framework of the regrets that they all felt, various different types of people at the tail end of their lives, what they were regretting. And she put this book together that had the top five of them. And it they are, one, I wish I had had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Three, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Well, that one hits a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. Five, I wish I'd let myself be happier. Yeah. I think it's the first one that I was trying to say before, that courage to express yourself and like to me my perspective of that is expressing yourself in trying new things you know exactly like you said getting yourself in the game having the courage to look silly but just to do the thing anyway Mm, definitely definitely um i want to jump into the business side of things more and the content creation side of things more so just correct me if i don't have the right understanding here so basically your business as it currently stands is um, 
you've got a top of funnel stuff, which is all the content, YouTube, Instagram, etc. And then you've got courses, coaching, and is there anything else? No. Yeah. So it's mostly just um, courses, programs that we run across various different topics. I used to do one-on-one coaching. You know, that's kind of how I started my journey. Obviously, you do things in a more intimate environment to test a lot of your models and systems and things like that. But we've kind of gotten to the point where we're trying to scale it, reach more people. So we do have, yeah, lots of different programs. Like I mentioned before, I've got a program all about becoming influential, essentially building a personal brand, building a dedicated community, a true fans community, if you will, Mm -hmm. um, based on the creator archetype. So it's not just like, yeah, I post this exact type of content, although that can work for some a lot of people walk away from those programs feeling really disappointed or it's an unsustainable way to grow. And so we wanted to create a really personalized program that can still reach a lot of people, which is a very difficult thing to do. It's a challenge, um, yeah, yeah, for sure. But so that's why with that one specifically, we run live rounds. So, you know, every person's going to have small nuance situations that come up or feedback or support that they need. And so twice a year we run a live round for that alongside the program. Um, but we have another program called Simply Business, which is just essentially for anyone wanting to start like the very potent needle moving things that you need to do to start a business and none of the fluff. Because, you know, as you mentioned a, a lot of times, like personal development mindset, all of this kind of stuff is the hard part of entrepreneurship. Everything that we've mm. been speaking about, that's the difficult stuff. That's getting mm. to know yourself and overcoming your blocks and fears and limitations. Like that's the stuff that takes a work. The business strategy should be the the simple part. I don't want to call it easy, but it's mm. it should be the simpler part of it because, you know, posting on Instagram is not difficult. Battling the demons of perfectionism, fear, and <laughs> all of that, that's the difficult part, you know. I spent yeah. time with a client this morning who uh, she's incredible at creating content but is in a paralysis state due to fear. So it's not – that's what people think takes a lot of time in business isn't usually what takes time. It's all the other stuff that comes with it. And so we've got a program that teaches people to move past that. Um, and then a Vibe Sales School, which is our take on a sales program. But we just think of our business like the counterculture. We like to do yeah. everything the opposite way to everybody else teaching it. You know, while everyone else is teaching sales from the perspective of like scripts and hardcore funnels and all of this kind of stuff, we teach attraction marketing where it's like get the yes through your content, through your relationship building, through your branding before mm. you even sell the product. So the Chillpreneur company is basically just doing things differently to how everybody else does it. I've got um this random idea at the moment where it's like, you know, real estate agents. Yeah. Because <laughs> the chill side of it. They're all this they wear this they have the same suits, they drive the same BMWs, yeah. they do all the same shit. I was wondering, what if you started a like real estate agency that doesn't have a dress code that is just like chillers? <laughs> that would be very chillpreneur. Honestly, that like that's the biggest everything that we do inside of this company is like what is everybody else doing and how can we make it cool? <laughs> Sometimes the status quo is there for a good reason. So yeah. I've I'm just kind of flesh out trying to flesh out whether this idea is stupid or <laughs> it's just everyone's, you know, have you, do you know what mimetic desire is like mimesis mm. is? It's basically the idea that we look at other people and we just mimic. Yeah. Right. All of our desires and goals are pretty much mimic, mimicking the people around us. Yeah. So like has everyone just, yeah. Has everyone just gone, you know, we have to be, we have to wear suits and look professional or is it valid because people are selling their biggest asset potentially and they don't want some dude rocking up in just like a relaxed suit <laughs> or like a relaxed shirt and maybe it doesn't maintain a high level of, I don't know, com- doesn't build a high level of confidence. Anyway, I don't know. I think that that particular conversation is probably more complex in the sense of how we've been programmed as a society to kind of view professionalism. So if I were to sit here and, you know, get 10 people to write down on a piece of paper, describe to me like a 
business person, you know, like a professional business person, I guarantee there would be certain like markers of their aesthetic or the, you know, the way that they hold themselves. And so I think that people just play into stereotypes because it's easier. So, Mm. you know, the stereotype of a professional business person is dressing a certain way, acting a certain way, driving a certain car even to go against the grain, which is essentially what we're trying to do with this business. But this exactly like you said, the status quo is there for a reason. So we like to dance on the edge. You know, we Mm. still maintain like super high professionalism in let's say like our video quality. Mm. Uh, We hire out studios, you know, people are recording courses where they're just on their phone in their car in a Facebook group. Like we go the opposite direction in that. We like hire a studio, film everything absolutely professionally. So there's the status quo that we say this is important because it's going to make people feel comfortable. That's the stereotype that's going to make people feel like they can trust us, but then there's the envelopes that we can push, you know, the the language, like we swear a lot in our content, for example, um, the imagery that we use, you know, while someone might put a picture of like an entrepreneur in a boardroom, we've got like a dude skateboarding. So it's like... Yeah. You, you skateboarding. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely not. Me skateboarding uh-uh. is like a helmet, elbow pads, wrist pads, everything. It's it's very not cool. <laughs> I love that. You should definitely do that because that is kind of cool. You know, it's like, it's cool to be safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, when you do Muay Thai, everything that you can injure in skateboarding is what you need to not have injured when you do Muay Thai. So I'm like bubble yeah. wrapped up when I try to skateboard. But, you know, trying to... I think the stat, like exactly like you said, like the status quo definitely exists to build trust immediately within people, but then pioneers, disruptors, game changers, whatever you want to call whatever internet terminology you want to use for someone doing something differently. It's like this, this, this uh, back and forth between what they know people are going to accept and how they can challenge that to get people to think differently. Mm. Mm. The, that was there the, the whole time. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. The, um, someone that I really like at the moment that is kind of crushing it but not being traditional is Elon Musk. He's constantly doing random ass things but you, again, super effective in whatever he's doing. So yeah. it kind of doesn't matter. Yeah. He pushes the envelope so you can do a little it. bit. Yeah, he's got yeah, I mean, he's- the company, the the credentials, the expertise, the experience, all of that kind of stuff, but yet he's changing what it means to be an entrepreneur just slowly but surely doing all these little quirky things and making it more acceptable mm-hmm. for other people to do that as well. Like that's, you know, when you think about the life cycle of products, like that's a good analogy to think about disruptors or counterculture entrepreneurs where you will do something different So let's say you're a real estate agent and you want to, you know, come out in your flip-flops and your casual clothes. You have to accept that for a while, your only customers are going to be what that's called the early adopters. You know, the Mm. people that are like, whoa, that's so different. Like I'm going to be different by choosing that option. You know, I resonate with that. That's my value set as well. I think it should be chill. There's going to be a the general population who at that stage doesn't get it until such time comes that you've gained enough interest um, or enough results with the early adopters that a portion of those general that general audience is going to come along as well. Then mm. one day it'll just become the norm and everyone will be mm. wearing flip-flops and, and stuff like that. And then you'll start wearing suits again. Exactly. <laughs> and then that's how fashion trends have a 20-year cycle, kids. Thank you for coming to our fashion list. <laughs> you know what? You know what? I just saw that firsthand on Friday. Yeah. So I went to Good Things yeah. Festival, which yeah, was nice. um, Limp Biscuit yeah. was one of the headliners. I saw him about 10 years ago. Yeah. And he's wearing like skate shoes, baggy pants, a baggy tee and yeah. a blazer, a bomber jacket. He, I remember seeing him 10 years ago and looking at his outfit going, geez, he's like aged because it was cool in the 90s, yeah. right? Yeah. And he's wearing the same thing and it's not really – it wasn't really cool then. Yeah. But it's gone back around it's and cool I looked now. at him again I'm like, dude, 
he's fresh. Like, yeah. and he's worn the same thing for 20 years. You went straight home and bought a new pair of DCs, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, but but I appreciated the, the outfit a lot more now than I did 10 years ago. So yeah. it's, that, it's that cycle. It comes around. Um, it does come around. I wonder what's next. I don't know what's next. The um, I wanted to ask you, and this is a personal question for me. How did you begin one-on-one coaching? How do you how did you find these people? Um, so prior to starting my business in 2017, I'd already been creating content on YouTube. You know the fitness stuff that the girlies in the the Reddit form were talking about. Um, huh? but I had just like I graduated my degree in business and marketing and I was made redundant from my job so I was like what am I going to do essentially wanted to start this online business um and I was really I don't want to say I'm lucky but like at that point my business was able to take off quite quickly because I'd already built that audience Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I essentially just set up my online business I already had my audience even though I was in health and fitness but that's when I kind of did pivot into talking more about business and mindset Mm -hmm. um and I was just at that stage using my experience so I'd you know, similar to you, worked in events um, and worked for a wine company as well as a skincare company. And I had set up my own little like social media marketing agency as a side hustle along this. So very just basic in the beginning was like coaching people on what I knew, you know what I mean, which was the marketing kind of stuff. And then Mm -hmm. worked one-on-one coaching from probably 2017 to 2018 then scaled that into like group coaching, then built a bunch of online courses, did the membership thing. And obviously we're, we're here now mostly selling online courses. So mm-hmm. to make it as simple as possible, I built an audience. Start with content. Yeah, Start with yeah, content. yeah, yeah. I, I, and, yeah. and that is my story. That's why my best selling product is Influential AF Academy, which was previously called Influencer Vibes. It's why I'm so passionate. Like I will scream until the cows come home for entrepreneurs to focus on building an audience first and foremost. The reason why I have everything, you know, having made millions of dollars on the internet, have my chillpreneur company, we're also launching a clothing brand now called Not Busy. Like everything that I have built is off the back of having that audience, having that community, having those true fans there. And the reason why I started all of this in the first place was when I was studying we had this like compulsory event that we had to go to for one of the classes. It was like some, I don't know, like marketers would come in and speak to us about different types of marketing careers that you could go down after studying marketing. It was very boring and I didn't want to go, but it was compulsory. But it honestly, it changed my life. Talk about those moments that like those experiences where you have that idea. One of the marketers was like, if you want to ride the wave of digital entrepreneurship, and mind you, this is in 2014, He said, if you want to ride the wave of digital entrepreneurship, the first thing you should do is get online and build an audience. I didn't even know what digital entrepreneurship is. I didn't know what he was saying. I uploaded my first YouTube video the next day. Like no skill, no expertise. Like, oh, my God, it's still on my channel. You can go back and look at it. I have the, like, the ticket stub from the event and then my first YouTube video was up, like, two days later or a day later or something. Um, And just since then, since, like, October 2014, all I've done is build an audience. And from that I've been able to, like, you know, build two businesses essentially, like have incredible opportunities, collaborate with brands, uh, speak at amazing events like VidCon, partner with YouTube, build all these friendships. Like so much has come out of just having that audience and focusing on building that community. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Do What point did you begin to try and monetize? Of building the audience? I didn't make any money. Ever. Oh, Just. till I <laughs> until now, I haven't made one single cent. I'm setting up a Patreon. No. Um, I was going to say, well, Patreon is an interesting one. Maybe with the podcast, it's like, do you set up a Patreon early or do you just? wait for a while it just really depends what business model you want to go down so for me i didn't make any what i was going to say was i didn't make any money until i started my business except for one black brand collaboration which paid me a hundred dollars which felt like the greatest thing in the world at the time (laughs) it was for a scale like a weight scale um but i didn't really do a lot of collaborations i actually only got youtube collaborations after i'd started my business so in 2017 but i didn't Mm. monetize at all until I actually started my business. I think I had about Mm. 20,000 followers on YouTube at the time. Mm. Um, But 
I don't think there's any, there's never a wrong time to start monetizing and there's never a wrong way to monetize. I've created Mm. a lot of products that have failed. This is something Mm. that I feel like not a lot of people talk about. Like I've created million dollar products that have made, you know, just so, changed so many people's lives and then I've created products that haven't haven't sold at all. You know, my first mm. course that I ever made and I spent so much time on it um, didn't sell at all. Like I made like basically no sales and this was already after making six figures in one-on-one coaching. For some reason, just the messaging, the positioning, the timing, whatever, it was off. Um, so I personally don't believe like if you have that audience there and you've built enough trust, again, it just, I feel like we're circling back to the same thing but people are so afraid to try a patreon or this product or that because they're so afraid to fail but it's like you're never going to know what's going to work until you know what doesn't work you're never going to get it right Mm. the first time so if you try one-on-one coaching off the back of having a podcast audience and it's amazing for a little while and then you start to hate it you realize that it's it's draining your time and so you want to scale that into a more information-based product like it's just just about what the market wants what you want and you're not going to know that until you test it um and how's the business going now amazing so thriving amazing. we're going through a big pivot which is very scary and so i say yep. amazing amazing in optimism so we essentially you know running really really successful programs i was doing a lot of group cohort style programs and at the end sort of halfway through this year we essentially decided to close everything down and rebuild all of our courses, all of our programs, and build that into a more community-based platform. So without, Mm. like, revealing my whole 2024 plans, you know, we have all of these amazing education programs, but at the end of the day, education really is becoming a bit of a commodity. And one thing that's really missing from the current kind of business model that we have at this stage is community side of it like community is why I started my business community is why I'm here and we want to build a new business model that is very very community focused so we're building a whole entire platform just going in a completely different direction but in order to do that successfully it has meant scaling back on a lot of stuff which is very scary obviously we did it you know saved and had had everything we needed to do in place to be able to do that but yeah it's more so Lots of growth. Lots of growth is mm. coming, but it's mm. a scary free fall, an exciting free fall, I'm going to say. I understand. I understand fully. The, that leads into my next thing, which I wanted to talk to you about, which was content and community. So yeah. how does somebody build a community online? Like what is the so, ideal way to approach it? I want to be really practical. I want to be really practical in this because I think, you know, you can go in a f- theoretical There could be a theoretical answer to this, but I want to give exact steps. Hmm. Everything that we've been talking about here is number one. Firstly, you have to figure out, you want to build a community, you want to be a leader, you have to see that within yourself first. You have to get to the point where you are seeing yourself as a leader, seeing yourself as someone who has value to offer. Because if you're like, I'm just going to wing it, I'm just going to build a community, and it's not from that place of, I have something that I have to share, like not to be too corny about it, but like heart bursting energy because that is magnetism. That's charisma. That is where you're going to capture attention when you just almost have so much inside of you that you want to share with the world that you cannot keep it in. It has to go somewhere like that. Mm. Everything that I've, I didn't start in that way, by the way, I started because someone told me to and it worked out (laughs) like this. But what I've learned along the way is that the most magnetic content, everything that I've worked with people on has come from people just having to put their message out into the world, right? To figure out what that is for you, get to know yourself. The second step of that is you could probably take my quiz or whatever, but figure out the type of the type of creator you are. What is your creator archetype? Because what you'll do by understanding this information is you will save yourself a lot of time. There is so much information out there about building an audience, what platforms to be on, what type of content to create, when to create, when to post, how to show up, what hashtags to use, what captions to use. Captions matter? No, they don't matter. You've got to have a niche. No, you don't need to have a niche. Like there is so much information out there and most of it contradicts one another. (laughs) Why does it contradict one another? Because something worked for one person and something else worked for another person. And that's why we defined these creator archetypes because what works for an entertainer might not necessarily work for an artistic creator. And so Mm. we have 
defined all of the different pathways, blueprints, if you if you will, based on your creator archetype, right? So figure out what type of creator you are. Then from there, you can figure out what platform is best going to highlight my natural skills and personality. Do I want to be on TikTok where it's more raw, real, authentic, short, sharp? Do I want to be on Instagram where it's a little more curated, a little more lifestyle artistic? You know, do I want to be on YouTube? Do I want to be on a podcast? What about Facebook? <laughs> That still exists. <laughs> the second my grandpa got Facebook, I was like, I'm out. <laughs> but whatever platform it is, you know, it might be SoundCloud. There's there's lots of platforms. But, you know, based on, yeah. again, like that, that Venn diagram that I talked about before, what you're talking about, how you're talking about it, which is your creator archetype, and then what of you do you want to bring to the table, your personal points of difference, then you can decide what platform is best going to highlight that. And obviously, if you create on one platform, then you just post it to the rest of them. You just repurpose it. Um, but then after you figured out, then now it's obviously down to just creating the content. You know, now you build yourself a content system. You know, how do I come up with ideas? How do I produce? How do I edit? And how do I post? Those are the four stages of getting content out into the world. And then you just get really good at it by doing it lots and lots and lots and lots of times. <laughs> And then how does that tie into actually leading to genuine community? So when it comes to content creation, I mean, inside of my program, Influential AF Academy, I teach like there's different types of content. I think this is the big part of content creation and community building that people miss is they try to do it all in one. That doesn't work. It doesn't work as well. You know, you should be creating, you should have a content strategy that allows for different types of content to do different things. Your sales posts shouldn't be your community building posts. Your visibility post shouldn't be where you're trying to build trust. You know what I mean? It can kind of work together and there will always be crossover. But the strategy that I teach is, and this is something, I didn't invent this, this is something that they taught us at YouTube, um, back in the old YouTube days. Google used to run this incredible, incredible support program for creators where they would invite us to Google and teach us all this stuff. They don't do it anymore, which is really disappointing. Mm. But um, so there's four different types of content, your hero content, which is the content that you'll create to essentially go viral. As a podcaster, that might be a big, you know, notable guest collaboration. If you are someone who is an entertainer, it might be like a really big idea, like the the Red Bull skydive from space. You don't have to go that far, but that kind of like big idea content. Then you also have your help content, which is like your general everyday reach content so it's the stuff that might it's probably not going to go viral it's not going to take a lot of time to build but you are doing it to reach new people you know and based on the platform you choose and the type of creator you are there's different strategies that you'll use so like there's different seo on every different platform and there's different formats if you're on reels are you using trending sounds if you're on youtube your titles and thumbnails like that kind of stuff right this is to reach people And then there's community building content, which is your hub content. So this is the content that you create for your community, Q&As, lives, Instagram stories, behind the scenes content, you know, actually really getting into the nitty gritty. You're not going to get seen by a new audience necessarily with this content, but it's building a connection. It's building a relationship and it's building trust with your current community. Mm. And then if you have a business, you have your sales content as well, you know, where it's like a direct call to action piece of content. What do you think about like replying to people individually and genuinely and like is that important do you think? It depends on the type of creator you are. So in the creator archetypes, if you are, first of all, it depends do you want to or not. You can still build Mm. an incredible connection with people without spending all your time in the DMs. But, for Mm. example, a relationship-based creator, which is the type of creator that I am, I love the DMs. Like I'm a Y2K texter. Like, you know what I mean? Like I'll just text people, voice note people. It doesn't feel like a lot of work to me. Whereas someone to go into their DMs and to respond to three messages is like the end of the earth. You know what I mean? I also, obviously ADHD, I will see a message and then respond three weeks later. But still, when I do it, I enjoy doing it. Um, Whereas for someone who maybe wants to create that more academically, like they're an educator archetype. They just want to put the information and not have as parasocial of a relationship with their community. That doesn't mean that you can't build trust. That's what it, that doesn't mean that you have to forego having an intimate relationship. It just looks different, you know? So based on the type of creator, how you create trust and intimacy with your community is really going to depend, but that's all based on your personal preference as well as your personality, you know? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. All right. Well, I, um, yeah, I, I've never been one to figure out how to do the community side of things very well. It's never been a skill that I've had yet. So I'm, uh, I speak to a lot of people and everybody that seems to have some form of successful business or the content creator, it's all community, yeah. successful business, community, successful content creator, community. Yeah. So I'm thinking to myself, i got to figure this out. But for gotta, you- how to make friends, yeah. step one. <laughs> for you, like, it's, it's, think about, okay, so like your podcast is going to be essentially like the core, like center of your business essentially at this stage anyway. It's like really where you are growing getting visibility, building the audience, and then sprouting off that will come products and services or something eventually. So if the podcast is the main thing, how can you allow the listeners that you currently have to have a vested interest in these episodes? You know, it might be as simple. Pay them $100. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Listen, and I will give you money. (laughs) But it might be as simple as, you know, if you, let's say you have your Instagram on the side of this and you're, you're, you're encouraging your listeners to go over there because they're going to get something that they can't get here on the podcast. There always needs to be incentive for action. So you're encouraging them to go over there, but then giving them a vested interest in your podcast might be as simple as, you know, getting guests to ask questions, sorry, getting your community to ask questions to your guests. And then mm. in the early stage of the podcast, you don't understand how powerful it would be to say, hey, you know, I promoted that Erin was coming on the podcast today and I reached out to the community and, you know, Steve wanted to ask the question and then you read it out. Saying that person's Mm. name, like that just that little kind of stuff, like recognizing your community is powerful. It doesn't mean that you need to go have like Mm. a 10-hour conversation in the DMs, but you've made recognition to the fact that there are actually humans in this experience with you. Mm. Well, that's the hard part, right? It's And that's going back to what we're talking about with people being very spiteful and hateful on comments. It's as though there's a forget, like they forget that everyone's it's human. human. Mm-hmm. Um, I've known, I, I had another podcast where I mentioned something very similar. Someone was just sending me abusive messages and then I called them. <laughs> they just the whole conversation just changed yeah. <laughs> just straight away. Sometimes them. people just are lonely as well. You know what I mean? And oh it's, yeah. It's most a, of the time. It's a, it's, it's a cry for attention. That's what I mean. That's why mm. when I mentioned before having empathy, you know, that's such a powerful, very courageous thing to do. But like, I guarantee you, if I called a lot of it people, worked. it would actually end up being, you know, quite a harmonious conversation, but a lot of it probably people would just be. be seen. Yeah. Maybe you should try that. Maybe that'll build like new community audience. Hey, what's your number? <laughs> Hey, you said that I need to make be like focus on my biological clock and not give in to my midlife crisis. What's wrong? Are you okay? <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> Who hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. I've got these really funny like sandals. This is completely unrelated, but ADHD going back to moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got these really funny sandals. That they're, they're they're grounding sandals. Mm-hmm. So they have they're basically like the closest thing I've found to walking barefoot without being barefoot. Nice. And I'm wearing them and walking the dog. And this guy, this tradie in his car in his Ute with another like tradie, looks at me and like says yells out something out of the out of the um window out of the car as he's driving by. <laughs> He just, I looked at him like, sorry, what? Because I had headphones in. He said, what are those? Or I said something along those lines of like, what do you do? No, not even what, but like not nice. What are those? Uh, Not funny. What are those? Or like, what are you wearing? Like, what is that? Or, and then I, and I looked at him and I thought, I just looked at him and I said, I, dude, you just don't get it. And he just stopped and he was really confused. (laughs) Yeah. You turn around, you'd be like, you don't know. You don't get it. And he looks at me and he goes, yeah, he goes away from, he looks at me and he kind of is a bit taken aback and he goes, yeah, I don't get it. And I'm like, I know you don't. (laughs) I just kept walking. (laughs) I love that. I love that. So much of what people do is so pointless. And then when you call them out on it, it's like, yep, swallow my words. Just confused. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I'm conscious of time. So I wanted to jump into just a few like rapid fires and awesome. get a bit of, get a bit of idea, get a few ideas from you and then we can uh, call it. So you ready? I'm ready. Rapid fire. All right, let's do it. If you could do one tourist activity before you died or you may have already done it, what would it be? 
Oh my God. My bucket list is like 10. This is the worst question to ask someone who wants to do everything. But one tourist activity that I want to do is I want to skydive. I really want to okay. skydive. <laughs> Somewhere How do we get really you do cool. that tomorrow. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm going to go do it right now. <laughs> do you want to go skydiving tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> I would, but I have to go hang out with my alpacas on my farm. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm hearing all talk here. Okay. Where would you skydive if you could skydive in any way in the world? Oh, man. Somewhere tropical, to be honest. I love like an ocean tropical vibe. If I was Skydive into the ocean. <laughs> I can't skydive and see concrete below me. So anywhere yeah. that that doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Um, if you could only recommend one book for somebody to read for their whole lifetime, what would it be? Psycho-Cybernetics. That is honestly- what is that? It's such a good book. So a lot of the kind of like groundwork for my philosophy, Becoming the Coolest Person You Know, came from this book. Essentially, this book is about identity. It's about self-concept. It's about how we perceive ourselves. Uh, Dr. Maxwell Maltz, who wrote the book, he is a plastic surgeon and essentially documented the differences between people's post-surgery lives based on how they perceive themselves. So some people would completely, completely change their life if they fixed, let's say, like a face, quote-unquote, imperfection. Um, whereas some people didn't and he wanted to know the difference between why some people did and it all came down to the inner mirror, how we see ourselves. And so mm. that's where a lot of that work came from. It's an incredible book. So that would be probably the most impactful book you've read? I think so. I've read it like six times. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. And uh, if you give the listeners the top three things they could do to create a life similar to yours, what would they be? Try new things. Get hobbies. Like pursue your interests. I know – Hobbies is such a weird injection into the personal development conversation, mm. but as I've hopefully painted the picture today in this conversation, it can change your life. It can change the way you see yourself. It can change your ideation process. It can help you meet new people. Like I had a conversation with a friend the other day who is feeling really lonely and like my answer is do a sport, try a new hobby. Like mm. as an adult, the easiest way to meet people, I built my whole entire network, my best friends all come out of my Muay Thai and all the different things that I've tried. So, mm. you know, just just do those things, things that you're interested in. Do things. <laughs> do things. That's my Go do stuff. One. <laughs> Two. One, go do stuff. The second is get to know yourself. Like as we've okay. spoken about here today, the more you know yourself, the richer your life will be in all areas because mm-hmm. – it's going to be so unique and personal to you. I think exactly what was that terminology that you said, the mimicking terminology. That is mimesis. so common, so common. And that is just a tragedy to live somebody else's life when you have everything available to live truly authentically to yourself. And the third thing is stop identifying with your age <laughs> that's the other <laughs> thing is as well be a damn child explore things yes. try things don't, maybe don't be a child but be childlike be childlike that's a better way to put it <laughs> yeah 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 just start crying on the floor <laughs> sometimes I mean, you, you need cry to on the floor if you need. <laughs> somatic yeah. release sometimes you need to <laughs> i love it and then the last question um what's the why of all this what do you think the meaning of life is Computing, have fun. Honestly, I really, as I do think it is as simple as we are here to enjoy ourselves. Like, what else can it be? Yes, make a difference in other people's lives and all of this kind of stuff. But everything that we do, everything that we've built our culture and society around is in the pursuit of happiness. And so mm. I think the meaning of it all, unfortunately, a lot of what we do to chase that experience doesn't result makes in us that. unhappy yeah you know if, like a lot of like work and financial gain and oh, what did jim carrey say i wish people could all become rich and famous to show them that it wasn't the answer i just yeah. think at the end of the day it's in in the scheme of it all like not to be too existential but we're like spinning on a rock in the middle of space and like time is going like that our, our experience in this in the relative to time is like this 
why not enjoy yourself? Like, why not do everything that you can? I don't know. There's going to be a whole lot of like, because this, 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 that, and the other, but like, that's, that's the journey. You know what I mean? Is to figure out for you based on who you are, getting to know yourself, how to just enjoy this little bit of time you got here. Love it. Thank you, Aaron. Thank Appreciate you. you coming on the podcast. I loved this conversation so much. <laughs> I feel like we could talk for like another 10 hours, but we might could. have to do another. We definitely could. I'll have to get you on our podcast and we'll just continue the conversation. I would love that. I love I've it. not really been on any podcasts, so I just. <laughs> It'll be exactly like this. We'll just chat. <laughs> love it. Love awesome. it. Awesome. Thank right. you. Thanks, Aaron.